Ghana's new aquaculture development plan aims to increase fish farming output from about 89,000 tons in 2021 to about 200,000 tons in 2027, and 136% increase. Is this feasible, considering the fact that the aquaculture industry has been grappling with challenges for the past five years? In today's episode of Food Chain, I bring you to Flossel Farms, all the way at Sogakope in the Volta region to find out if this industry is really capable of achieving that. And I have here with me, Evans. Hello. Hi, Evans. Hi, welcome to Flossel Farms. Thank you very much. Let's begin with the capacity. What's your capacity here? Well, the hatchery and the nursery all together has a total installed uh, uh, capacity of 24 million fingerlings uh, per year. And then our cage grouts where we bring the fish to table size has a capacity of 2,500 uh, tons. Looking at your capacity, do you believe in the new aquaculture development plan? Uh, yes, 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 yes and no because a dream is a dream, a plan is a plan. Uh, we've had very serious challenges in the past five years in spite of everybody's capacity that doesn't allow any farm to run at the full capacity. So if we have a, a dream or a vision to grow by 136% our production, it means that it is the individual farm that has to grow in their capacity and in their ability to turn all these things around. So it's kind of like yes and no. What have been some of the challenges? I know a few the diseases, Russia, Ukraine war, you know, impact affecting feed prices. Elaborate, we've been hearing about this in the news. What exactly happened on the ground? Well, the, the, the disease remains today the record holder in terms of the, the setback in the industry uh, for close to five years, 2018 all the way to 2021 uh, and a little bit into 2022. Uh, we've had various kind of fish diseases that uh, impacted the industry significantly. Two major ones was streptococcus infection that came around 2018 there about, and through to 2019, affecting fish that were about three fingers like this, 80 grams and above. And across farms, the loss was in uh, was in excess of sometimes 50 tons a day. And so, altogether, that period. The loss due to the strap alone was close to 50 million USD. Wow. All the farms put together. That's a big blow to a young industry. And then when that one was facing out, uh, we came right into contact with another kind of disease called the ISKMV, uh, which is the big belly disease. The fish's spleen and liver will fail. It cannot extract waste from its system, so the stomach gets very big and then they die off. That one can wipe out close to 80-85% of your stock within seven days if it enters your ponds. Just uh, seven days and you are completely clean enough. So we are left wow. with 2%. Uh, sorry, we are left with about uh, 15 to 20% yeah. to, to produce. And that means a lot of impact on your capacity. And then uh, the recent price increases and in inflation in the system. So a bag of fish feed that used to be 79 CDs is between 280 to 310 CDs now. Uh, so that means the cost of production coming from feed alone, which is about 70% of your production cost, is gone up by that. The utilities have gone up an average of 30% two times already. And, uh, and, and then there was the question of the availability of the ingredients themselves. So they were not available and even if you found them, it was too expensive to use for the feed. The feed counts are too expensive, and then the fish also has to uh, become expensive directly, you know. And so that's been the challenge that the industry has faced. Uh, but that 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 ambition of 200,000 tons has a lot of impact on the environment as well. So even if we convert that using a factor of like 1.3, we think you are going to need 300,000 tons of feed in our waters. You know, 300,000 tons of carbon. 300,000 tons of nitrogen, it has to be oxidized somehow. So we have to be ready for all that, all that change that comes with it, you know. 
can the market absorb that? Are the sellers ready to handle that? Are the financiers also ready to handle that? Because it doesn't take only the farmer yeah. or the government. It's a, long chain. it's a very long chain, particularly the money to pay for the feed. It's a very long chain. And then the, at the end of the day, the figure could help impact the job creation and protein availability and a lot of economic benefits. So that aspect of it, yes, it's okay. But then the requirements, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we are. Ready. ready for that otherwise we will not be cancelling things like duty for input materials at this time mm. so it's, it's like saying we need to run faster but at the same time you are holding our back of the, the back of the dress you know mm. it's not possible wow so um has there been any government interventions all these years let's start from the diseases were there any vaccines that were giving uh, any compensation i know the port farmers Save them after birth flu. I mean, did you have any? That would have been a blessing during the disease. We were just on our own. The unfortunate fish farmer was just left to his, his or her own faith, unlike our colleagues in the poultry that would get one form of support or the other. This one, zero support, nothing. Your fish is dead, you collect it, you dig a hole, you bury it, you wash your hand, you go and cry. You know, and, and, wow. and that's how it was for five years. For I don't know if you've seen a crate of fish for 50 kilos. Mm -hmm. Like there are some farms were collecting about 200 of that on a daily basis. You know, that's how bad the disease was. So there was some kind of intervention from the government to introduce a vaccine for the ISKV, to introduce some vaccine also from the strepto, streptococcus. Yeah, so there were good interventions, but wrongly, wrongly timed, you know. If it came a couple of years earlier, yeah, so uh, some way, somehow, the impact is coming down now. So part of it can also be introduced, but can be, can be uh, linked to that. And but most importantly, it's financial support for the farms, because uh, it's not only the vaccine that grows the fish. You know, the animals need to eat. The labor needs to be taken care of. And uh, so, so calling calling for two hundred thousand. Yes, it's a very good number. Every country is doing it, but they are committed to it. They are putting resources to it. It means we must be able to farm at least two hundred fifty thousand tons of maize, a similar of 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 of, uh, of soya, so, yeah. and then about three hundred thousand of fish feed, fish meal. You know, to be able to make the feed. So it's a complete value chain that needs to be stimulated at the various ends. We cannot just pick the 200,000 and hope that that alone will take care of them, no. We need the veterinary people on board. We need the extension services people. You need the feed companies. You need the farmer. You need the feeder as well. Mm. Yes. Mm. So, with the um, importation of feed or feed production in general, I mean, uh, there were issues that there is maize available or there are soya available but then people are also complain that they do not have access to it what do you think was the break in communication and the challenge along the value chain i don't think it was a break in communication if it is there it is there if it is because the, the grains are there to be sold the farmer produced them so that they could sell so if it's there it will be uh, it will be made available for the farmer to buy and to use to uh, to produce uh, that actually created a very very big uh, impasse for a very short time you know uh, just within the space of four 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 months the maize prices moved from 69 or something to around 150 and then from 150 to 200 and now we talk about 300 and uh, it's, it's both maize and, and, and so, yeah. yes and then it's the same for poultry and fish you know poultry and fish as well so I understand most of your farms have been shut down. Yes, a lot of a lot of the farmers disappeared. It's you know when we invest to this extent to this level, and you lose close to ninety percent of your stock, eighty percent of your stock, no help comes from anywhere, and then the next batch of disease comes, another sixty seventy percent of your stock, no help from any anybody, and then the that means your 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 purchasing capacity for raw materials is going down you know your buying power is going down and then as though that was not enough came covid then there was no funeral there were no parties and stuff so people would not buy a lot so that also went down and then just when you are getting out of that it's when 
uh, there's high inflation and everything going up in the country, including utilities left right. So it makes it very impossible for most of the farmers to remain in business. At the end of the day, we lost them, just some few. We used to have about 900 farms, uh, total close to close to 17,000 jobs, you know, was what we had. Uh, people running the fish farms in the country. But now I don't think we have up to, uh, up to 5,000 employees in the industry anymore. A lot of it is gone. A lot of the farms are gone. A lot of the capacity is gone. That should bring us to about 100 farms or so. Yes, yes. So we have just about 100 or 120 farms out of the 900 farms that started. Does this squash the the motivation for entrepreneurship because I mean our leaders are always telling us be innovative venture into something do not wait for the white collar jobs uh, yes this is the some the problem some of us have because people just go about saying all these things but they don't create opportunities even those of us who sacrifice our careers to 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 play in an industry like this to create opportunity for young people to come here and learn to share knowledge, to grow the fish, to support farmer groups and the less privileged societies and stuff. We don't have the right support, the right uh, monitoring and the right, yes, basically the right support that the state should be giving us. It's not there. It's not there at all. So a very little uh, challenge like this and the impact is very big. We are not the first country to start aquaculture. We're not the first country to run into this kind of diseases situation. It's been all over. It's been in China. It's been in the almighty US. It's been in UK. It's been in everywhere. Everybody has got to go through it. And none of them crash. They all just learn from it quickly, put the right support, and then it grows. You know, but here it has to be grown all alone by the farmer. That makes a very big difference. The same person who is hit is the same person who has to heal himself. The same person that has to do the growth. Hmm. So it's a lot complicated. Hmm. So you, you moved from what field to become a fish farmer? I, I used to be a food producer. I used to work for a company called Nestle. I used to make baby food, I used to make coffee, I made milk, and now I, I make protein. <laughs> what motivated you to move to this field? Because that, that, that's been how long now? It's been seven years now since okay. I, I became a, a fish farmer. It's just because I love it. It is good to see a life created from the beginning, to see someone taking a bite and smiling over what you've been able to put across. It's, it's been very satisfactory uh, having to watch students coming from even departments you didn't study to come and gain knowledge and learn all these things. It's very impactful to have other countries reaching out to you to say, oh, come, we've seen what you can do. Can you support us like this? Can we support us like that? And uh, those have been very, very impactful for me and uh, very fulfilling. Yes, so the challenges are there, but we love it, so we've got to make it happen. We just need, we just need proper stimulation, proper support, and the industry can fly. The potential is there, the water bodies are there, the knowledge is growing now, resources are there, feed quality has improved a lot, and people know how to farm fish better now than five years ago. So we just provide the right support and we go. Talking about making life, uh, you know, of the fish. the fish from the beginning. Yes. Where are we? And walk us through the, the life stages of a fish. <sighs> okay, so we are in our hatchery mm -hmm. ponds area now. Mm -hmm. The other side is where we keep our brew stock, the mm -hmm. male and female. Mm -hmm. We keep them in a ratio of one is to three. Every male has three wives. Hey. Basically, it's a lot of <laughs> sometimes we can even get to seven, and uh, we spawn them. And after the eight or the fourteen, we catch the females. We take the eggs out of their mouth. We hatch in the incubator. Then. And after hatching, that we get them into the small, small fry form, like what you see in that pond. Yeah. Very small. Every pond we put twenty thousand in them maximum. And then we grow them to the fingerling size. The fingerling size is what you saw Harvest. as harvesting. So we can. Uh, we send that to our nursery at the other side or we sell it to other farms where they also grow it to big size and they bring it to you to consume at the end. Okay, so the mating period, how long does it take for you to take 14 days maximum. 14 days? Yes. Okay, and then how long does it take for you to hatch 
So from the egg mm -hmm. to your plate, mm -hmm. it's 10 months. 10 months. From the egg, from the time the feed, we call it the egg from the mother. Okay. To the time you eat it with your banku and pepper. So the, the, the egg to the fry or? The egg to the fry is eight days. The fry to the fingerlings is a maximum of 60 days. Okay. So the 60 days we can do part here and do part of the nursery. And mm -hmm. then from the fingerling stage to your plate now, it's uh, 180 days. Okay. Aside these challenges, has this been a lucrative venture for you? Yes, if, if all the parameters are... So we've had good runs actually in the past. We've had very, very good runs. The numbers were good. And the, 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 the runs always get bad when the disease issues come. But it's also a matter of financial capacity. Uh, because biological challenges come and they will always come. But if the muscles are strong, the capacity is there, it will not impact that much. You can be able to turn around. So it's a very lucrative industry still. Agriculture in general is lucrative. Mm. How many employees do you have here? Uh, total 61. 61? Yes. Oh, great. So, where are we now? Uh, we are inside uh, our hatchery room, where we have some concrete tanks for holding and conditioning our fish and also these plastic tanks for growing fry and also for trials. Mm. Why the different shapes or tanks? It tells the story of the different faces of the company. When we first started, we were operating from here. All our fries were here and all our stock was here. We had a small capacity of 500,000 fish per month. But now we have a capacity close to 2 million, which is more than four times that. So we had to move everything from here to the outside in the earthen ponds. Okay. So what goes on here at the hatchery? Normally, they condition the fingerlings and also grade them like they are doing at our behind right now. After growing the fish for the first 21 days, they are harvested, brought here, graded into different sizes, size one, two, and then three. And then the small ones are conditioned here and sent back. The big ones are sold to other farms or sent to the, the nursery for growing. So at the nursery, what happens there? The nursery, we grow again from the 0 0.3 size all the way to uh, sometimes 3 or 5 grams and then we sell or take to the cages from there. So it's just like a, an advanced stage of this one. So what's your market audience? Uh, we are supplying to literally almost every farm in the country. Literally, almost big, small farms, they buy fingerlings from us because our fingerlings are very good, great and fast growing. Hmm. And so, and we have good survival too, so we have a good customer base. And then we also sell the big size to, uh, we sell the big size to uh, other farms, sorry, uh, uh, consumers like you and... Hmm. The price um, of tilapia has increased. What do you attribute this to? It's because of the cost of increasing the input materials. We've lost the exemption we had on importation of feed. That has been taken away. Price of feed went up uh, almost three and a half times. And so uh, the price of the fish correspondingly went, went up because the input became too high. Is this affecting your patronage? Yes, not a lot of people can buy one fish now between 35 and 50 cities. It's not everybody that can affect that. Mm. So that's why we're saying that if we go for the 200,000 thing the government wants us to do, we have to expand the various areas as well. The market also has to be supported. Under the aquaculture development plan, they want to increase market share from about 14% to 25% by 2027. Is this, is this feasible? Yes, the fact is that the pipeline is empty enough to be filled. I mean, the demand is there. There's no discussion about that. Even in neighboring countries, the demand is there. It's just uh, sustaining the, the, the productivity. That is the issue and all the requirements that come with it. The input material, even the value chain, the transportation to move. Uh, 89 tons of fish, 9,000 tons of feed around, fish around. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as moving around 200,000 tons fish. It's a lot of 
transport tank, storage conditions, energy, to and a lot of handling, and it has to be prepared for like that. Okay, for one of your challenges, utility tariffs. I know you run by electricity. Yes. How is that like? It's not been very friendly at all. We've seen tariffs increase by up to 30%, two or three times in the last six months. Uh, that's very uh, distasteful to us in other parts of the world where our colleagues are running the same industry in China, for example, where you are producing fish. Um, your utility rate is about uh, 25% of the commercial, all the industrial, the domestic rates, even in the US and others, the special rates that are applied to farmers. Uh, this is the only part that we are trying to expand the industry and the other, <coughs> at the same time, increasing the cost of utilities. And it's not friendly at all. Anything else you'd like to add that we may have not discussed? Uh, we just had to leave the government more and more to focus on the sector. This is a sector that has a value of over $200 trillion. Uh, it's a multi-stakeholder game. It's not just something you can leave to the farmer. Uh, nor the researchers at the universities, or the veterinary people, or the feed producer. It has to be the whole value chain that is stimulated so that we can get the kind of impact uh, that we are, are looking for. So we need the financing, we need the <coughs> veterinary, uh, we need the market. The whole thing must be supported. So if we just support one wing of it, you haven't helped. Top of research, really. The chamber recently made a call for research into other ingredients of making fish feed. And then I saw that, you know, uh, other types of tilapia are able to survive during the disease period. What do you make of this research into the industry? Yes, the industry cannot grow without research. Uh, the animals we are working with, they keep evolving, they keep, they keep mutating and changing all the time. So we need a lot of research to understand their behavior, what are their requirements, what rate are they com com uh, converting our protein we are giving them, and, and, and so on. So a lot of research, particularly led by the academic institutions, uh, required, just like it's done in other places, industry and research has to be hand in hand so that we can grow. We cannot grow at the rate at which we want without proper research. Fish farmers are optimistic about the growth of the aquaculture industry, yet they fear that this may not be achieved in due time. Today's episode of Food Chain focuses on the challenges in the aquaculture industry. All the way from Sugakope in the Volta region, my name is Emma Davis.